Okay, well welcome everyone uh, to our fifth webinar in the Alumni Career Webinar Series. Uh, our topic today is Strategies for Finding and Landing Your Career of Choice. My name is Katherine Tuttle and I'm the Alumni Career Services Coordinator here in the NC State Alumni Association and I am joined today by Gary Green who is a 1990 graduate of NC State and the owner of a Raleigh based recruiting company Green Resources. Green helps companies across the country locate and hire talent critical to the success of their organizations. And Gary truly excels in building and maintaining partnerships with his clients. This ability to build and maintain quality relationships has been instrumental in his professional life, but it also carries over um, some to, to some other areas as well. Um, Gary is very involved in the community, serving on the YMCA Advisory Committee, as well as on the board of the Raleigh Chamber and the Wake Education Partnership. He speaks to organizations around the triangle on a number of topics, including job search strategy, working with recruiting firms, um, and the power of building meaningful networking relationships. And this community focus and involvement has contributed to his company becoming one of the 50 fastest growing privately owned companies in the Triangle. Gary is a dynamic speaker and a friend uh, to the Alumni Association, so we are thrilled to have him here with us today. Um, before we begin, I want to cover a, a, a couple of quick housekeeping items. We do want to take questions throughout the session. So if you have a microphone and you want to raise your hand like we did earlier, we can give you the mic and you can ask your question live to Gary. Um, or if you prefer, you can just chat your question in the um, chat window at the bottom left um, and we will read your question aloud to the group. Just keep in mind that is a public forum so anything that you type in there everyone will be able to see. Um, so again, thank you to Gary, and with that, I'm going to turn it over. All right, thank you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for the introduction and inviting me to spend time with so many other NCSU alumni today. It really is an honor for me to speak with you. Our topic today, as you heard from Catherine, is strategies for finding and landing your career of choice. Some of you on the call today may be in a career already and looking for your next challenge. Some of you, unfortunately, may be out of work and struggling to land that next career. And some of you might be on the call to gather information to share with others. Whatever the reason, it's critical for me that each of you get value out of our time. And in order to do that, I'd like to start out first with setting some expectations. First, what I have to share is fairly simple. In fact, most of what we discussed today, you've probably heard before or thought of before. But the real question is, are you using what you learned the first time you heard it? And if so, have you gotten creative with it? And if not, just look at this as maybe a kick in the pants to get started. And second, what I have to share is not easy. And searching for a job is not fun. It requires work, preparation, creativity, diving deep into your network, or building your network and treating your job search as a full-time job in and of itself. Some of you have been searching for a long time now and are beyond discouraged with the process and the results. It's an extremely competitive market for jobs. Gary, we lost the microphone. Okay, am I back on? You are back on. All right, thank you. So at Green Resources, if we have currently over 100 openings, for each of those we're going to review at least 100 resumes. We're going to talk to perhaps 25 individuals. We're going to interview five of those individuals and maybe choose three quality candidates to present to our customer. It's a very competitive market. And the third thing is, unfortunately, I cannot guarantee results from our ideas generated today because it's going to take action to get those results, and that action is up to each of you. What is interesting is that we all sit here knowing that we should approach our resumes and interviews differently. When it comes down to it, many of us rarely do. But I can tell you that just picking up a pen and writing, not typing, but writing a quick thank you note, 
will set you apart from 90% of your competition for that next job. So what should we get out of our time together? Well, ideally, we all land that career of choice. That would be great. At the very least, we have a renewed enthusiasm that pushes us to take action. We gain some fresh ideas. And lastly, we get greater success out of our efforts. There's a story that I love of Sherlock Holmes and his faithful assistant Watson. They were on a camping expedition. And after a bite to eat around the fire, they settled into their tents for the night. Several hours later, Holmes startled his sleeping friend. Watson, Watson, wake up at once and tell me what you see. Watson rubbed his eyes, looked at the night sky, and said, stars. I see billions and billions of stars. Holmes replied, yeah, yeah, but what does that tell you? Billions of stars signal the potential existence of millions of planets. Watson yawned. The, the position of the moon tells me it's about 3 a.m. Yeah, 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 but what else, Holmes questioned. I'm tired, Watson whined. What does it tell you? Well, after a brief pause, Holmes replied, Watson, old boy, it tells me that somebody has stolen our tents. Now, what does this have to do with our topic today? Absolutely nothing. I just love that joke. No, no, seriously, it has everything everything to do with it. Just like not recognizing the obvious that the tents are missing, we apply to positions, sending out the same resume with little or no follow-up, no personal introductions, no unique offering, and wonder why we aren't getting the interview. After all, our experience is perfect for this job. We shouldn't have to do anything extra. Focusing back on a few basics of the job search process, though, can prove to be the difference maker for each of us. Now, personally, I graduated from North Carolina State University, as you heard, uh, back in 1990. I got into the recruiting industry, industry right out of graduating for that magical one year of experience. I was fortunate to immediately go into an industry I just love. After 10 years with another firm, I decided to leave and start my own company, Green Resources, back in 2000. As you heard from Catherine, we're a recruiting solutions company. We help Organizations locate, land, and develop the talent critical to their success. We have grown quickly over the years. Last year, we placed over 3,000 people into a wide variety of jobs. We've had numerous awards, recognitions, including Entrepreneur Magazine's 100 Hottest Companies in America. And I know that the actions behind our success can also help you land your next career. In fact, what I'm sharing with you today are almost the exact steps we take to land our customers at Green Resources. So what are those steps? First, we're going to talk about identifying your gifts, then developing a target list, identifying and researching target companies, using your network to make contact with the employer, preparing for that interview, and then how to follow up. I want to start first start with identifying your gifts. Yesterday I visited Indeed.com. You'll see their website in the bottom left of the screen. Indeed is a website that does a great job of pulling in most of the online job postings regardless of their location or their job board. In the past two weeks alone, there have been 5,530 job postings within 25 miles of NC State University. 5,530. I also visited volunteermatch.com. That's the website in the bottom right of your screen. Volunteer Match does a great job of helping individuals locate volunteer opportunities by using keywords and a defined radius to a given location. There are 424 volunteer opportunities currently within a 20-mile radius of NC State. Now, what I couldn't believe is that in all of those job postings and volunteer opportunities, almost 6,000 of them, none of them even included the word Wolfpack. But that's beside the point. The point is this. There are a lot of opportunities. Just because there are a lot of opportunities, it doesn't mean you should apply to all of them. I regularly, regularly talk to people who claim they're doing everything they can because they apply to 50 plus, 20 plus positions per week. To create better success, take the time to first identify your gifts. Now to do this, 
There's going to be three questions I'd like for you to answer and take some time doing this. You'll get out a sheet of paper and you'll create three columns. And at the top of each column will be one of these questions. What do I like to do well? Or what do I like to do? What do I do well? And what do I want to learn and keep on learning? You'll then list your answers, being as specific and creative as you can. As you create the list, begin to think more in terms of why an employer should hire you. The key here is to know or be able to imagine what a potential employer needs in regards to your skill sets. Now, once you've taken the time to identify your gifts, and it's critical to do this first, you're then going to develop a target list. I want to take you through how to do this. Indeed.com, as I mentioned earlier, is a great tool for de developing this list, or Google, or any other search engines. But you can enter keywords from your list that you've already created, the things you like to do, the things you do well, the things you want to learn and keep on learning, and put those keywords into a search on Indeed.com. And it's going to pull out any job postings that contain those keywords in their job descriptions. What types of jobs need that skill or character trait, you're going to now start being able to create a list. These might include opportunities in industries or jobs about which you have not even previously thought. You're going to be tracking down employers who are the best match for your selling points. You must limit your search to develop a list of target employers. So you're going to first start with one industry at a time. You've done a little bit of searching. You found an industry. And so in this industry, you're going to develop a list of keywords describing that target industry in order to broaden your search through Google or other sources like I've mentioned. And as the chart on this screen shows, under the industry, I'm going to list the roles that I can play in each of in, in this specific industry. So what role I could take on within the industry, what are my strengths, abilities, experiences I bring to that role? And then lastly, the companies that have a need for that role. So once again, an industry, and because of my searching on Indeed or whatever tool you may be using, you're going to come up with a list of jobs or roles that you can play. And then because of the work you did previously and what you like to do, what you do well, and what you want to learn and keep on learning, you will put a list of your strengths, abilities, experiences, and so forth together. And once you have that, only then is when you start uh, reaching out to locate companies that have that specific need. You're going to outline the quantifiable impact you can make performing these jobs at these companies. What are your measurable accomplishments? In essence, you're going to create a case study of why you are the best applicant for such a position. And it's OK to have multiple positions, but it's going to be a different case study for each of those positions and why you are the best applicant for that. So in the end, you're defining the perfect job, the perfect type of industry and company, the perfect location. For example, I want to be an events coordinator for a Chamber of Commerce in the Triangle. Very specific. I want to be a mechanical engineer at a scientific instrumentation company specializing in gas chromatography. By being this specific, you're going to be able to locate the companies that have that need and start uh, strategically finding a way to get introduced into those companies. I want to be an online researcher for a law firm specializing in patents and trademarks. I want to be a basketball official in the Atlantic Coast Conference. OK, maybe not that one. So in identifying uh, and researching the target companies, you've developed your target list. It's now uh, time to identify the companies that have a need for your skills. Which employers match your focus? You're going to list their name, location, industry, any information you can find about the company. If your target statement matches a previous employer, then add that firm's competitors to the list. You may not want to go back to your previous employer, but what other companies in the market would have a need for your skill set? You're going to research the target industry to add more companies to that list. 
And there are a number of resources that can help you do this. Our very own Alumni Association does a great job. They offer tools and resources to those of us looking for our next career, but they also offer tools and resources to employers looking for people like each of us. And uh, turning to them, now that you know exactly what you're looking for, they will likely have some ideas of companies that have that specific need. But you can also look at job openings, job boards like Indeed I mentioned or any of the other job boards you may find online. Use social media. Uh, many companies have Facebook pages. They certainly have LinkedIn pages. Researching that way, using Google to do keyword searches. The recruiting industry is a wonderful resource. If you have friends or acquaintances that are recruiters, turning to them, explaining what you're looking for, and they may have some ideas of companies that have that specific need. You can choose whether or not to work through them to get the position. What you're trying to do right now is just to gather a list of companies that uh, could best use your uh, talents. Personal, social, and business networks. If you're not currently involved in and around the community or networking to a great extent, it's something that I highly encourage that you do. Even when you're gainfully employed, you do not want to have to start building your network when you need that network. It's something that should be built every day. And as you're involved in and around the community, you want to continue to grow that so that when a need arises, such as finding your next position, you'll have, ter you'll have champions you can turn to to help you. The Chamber of Commerce is a wonderful place to turn to. As an individual, I would say every other week I get a call from the Chamber or from someone that met with the Chamber, and the Chamber referred them directly to me. But because of the Chamber referring them to me, I'm taking that call and not referring them down to, uh, to someone else to talk to because of the referral source. You can turn to whatever local Chamber of Commerce in that market for assistance. User groups or LinkedIn groups, groups and associations in general. Believe it or not, uh, well, the uh, NC State here has incredible libraries, but there are still libraries. There are still newspapers, publications, and all of those have incredible leads and research completed for you to find those companies that have a need for you. And then I would say most importantly are the nonprofit organizations. I mentioned volunteermatch.org earlier. Another wonderful site is NC Nonprofits, and NC Nonprofits has a specific focus in North Carolina, obviously, but another great resource to research all the nonprofit organizations. Because if there are certain jobs that you want, and the companies that you're trying to get to are involved in some of these nonprofit organizations, by getting involved in those, you're going to develop relationships. Not only are you going to make a difference for the nonprofit, but you're going to develop relationships with the type of companies that you would like to see yourself in one day. You're going to start investigating the companies in depth. You'll need to know as much as you can about the company, products, services, customers, competitors, technologies, and the challenges that company faces. In essence, you're going to be trying to answer several questions. I'll put them on the screen. Is this company a good fit for me? What are the employer's needs? How can I present myself to meet those needs? And then who are the key decision makers and influencers? And what is important to each of them? Now some of us may be sitting there saying, well, how do I find that out? How do I know what's important to them? By connecting with others who work there or did work there, LinkedIn does a great job of helping you locate such people. Even without a LinkedIn address, you can do some basic searches in LinkedIn and find individuals that work or have worked at that company. It even provides you, when you do have a LinkedIn address, it provides you avenues through your own network to connect with that person. Um, Gary, we have a, a question from Ron, if you're, um, if sure. you're taking one here. Ron, yeah. um, all you have to do uh, to ask your question is click on the talk button right here um, above the participants window. Ron?
Ron, if you have a microphone, um, you just click on talk. Oh, okay, Ron, okay. I hit it by mistake. No problem. <laughs> no problem. If people do have questions, uh, do feel free to type them in or, or um, again, raise your hand like Ron just did. Um, Gary, I want to just reiterate something you, you said earlier about being specific. I think a lot of times people um, mistakenly err on the side of being too general. They don't. They feel like if they're too specific, they're going to um, kind of, you know, exclude themselves from certain opportunities. But, but the fact of the matter is, in the networking process, and I'm sure you can speak to this, you know, the more specific you are about what you do well and how you can add value and what companies you're looking at. It, the more likely it is that, that your contacts um, and the resources that you mentioned are going to be able to help you. People are just simply uh, too busy and too stretched for time to you know, invest the time and energy required to kind of be the person to think all that through for you. Kevin, that's exactly right. There are, well, uh, a funny example of that is a networking event I was at the other day, and the person looked at me and asked, what do you specialize in? And I did this intentionally. I looked close to his name tag, and he was in insurance. So I backed up and I said, well, I specialize in insurance. But the, uh, the more specific you can be, so when candidates come and meet with us and they don't know what they want, well, then we don't know how to help them. And if you're sending out, we'll revisit this again in a few minutes, but your objective, if you have an objective on your resume, the objective is written specifically for the job that you're apply for which you're applying. It's very specific. This is the position I want and this is why. And your next resume is going to be a different position and why you want that position. It is okay with each of your discussions to have a different slant to your conversation. It is more important to be very specific. Now the fear and the concern that I hear from a lot of people is if I'm too specific, it's going to keep me from getting another opportunity when really I just need a job right now. So I will go talk to this company, and they may have one position, but if I'm too specific, saying I only want that, it's going to limit my ability to get any other position there. If you spend the time to know exactly what you're looking for, there is that position out there for you. And you can present yourself in a way with that company, this is what I'm looking for. It is okay to go in and say, this is why I want to work with your company, and the truth be known, uh, I'm open to other opportunities because uh, this is why your company specifically attracts me, but let me explain why this specific position is best for me and going into it that way. Uh, I, I still think it's more important to be specific in your search. For years, I mentioned this ties directly to green resources. When I grew up in the industry, I was trained to call on everything, and you would then bring in a percentage of that and it's, it's nice to have all these eggs in your basket. My approach was always, why can't I just get a big, ass, get big basket to hold big eggs and fewer eggs? And I had a list of 100 companies that I wanted to do business with. And instead of calling on the world, I created an argument of why we should be doing business with each of those 100 companies. And that's where I spent 100% of my time. And those companies became customers. And I would take the same approach as a candidate. Here's where I want to go to work, and I'm going to spend my time and my network helping me get an opportunity within these companies versus going after the world for an opportunity. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. But it will produce the results that you want, and not just a position that you don't care much for. I want to talk a little bit more about that by getting into you, how you use your network to make contact with the employer. Using your network, years ago I learned from a person who hired me into the recruiting industry that the easiest way to get an appointment, or in this case an interview, is to get somebody else to schedule it for you. I would say that 80% of the appointments I get with companies I did not schedule myself. I had someone in my network make an introduction, and many times that person is calling me versus me calling them to schedule the appointment. In fact, about a year ago, we tried a direct mail campaign with a certain number of prospects. Similar to sending your resume out to multiple employers, we sent out this form letter. It was personalized. 
and personally address, but it really was a form letter. The message was basically the same. We then followed up that direct mail piece with another one, individually addressed to that recipient. And unfortunately, it did not lead to an appointment. Two months later, though, I had a friend call asking if I had an interest in working with XYZ Corporation. Upon learning that I did, he made a personal introduction. It wasn't long before I received a call from that HR manager asking to meet due to that referral. The HR manager called me. And during that meeting, I had to ask them, do you recall some direct mail pieces sent to you a few weeks ago? And his reply was no. Let me remind you, I mean, I sent multiple letters to this person. But as soon as somebody else made the introduction, he had a vested interest then in meeting with me. The same is true for your job search. Even when the application process demands, and I know that 75% of them out there do this, they demand that you apply online. In fact, as a company, Green Resources, we ask for our applicants to apply online. You should still find someone who can walk into that hiring manager's office and make a personal introduction. Now let me stress a few more points about this step. First a minute about what has uh, been come to known as the Kevin Bacon game, or six degrees of separation. I can almost guarantee that for those of you in the same market or location, I could randomly pick six of you, put you in a circle, have one of you explain your ideal type of position, and someone else in that circle of six is going to have a connection, someone to introduce you to for that opportunity. But in order to earn that connection, you have to connect everybody else in the group. You have to have a, help someone who helps someone else in that group, who has a connection for someone else in the group, so on and so forth, until all six of you have been connected, which earns you that reference or that connection. I've done this numerous times with job seeker groups, and 100% of the times, 100% of the time, the circle has been complete. It does not take much to find someone that has a connection for you. Also, take the time to craft your script. Make it compelling. At Green Resources, we spend a lot of time making sure everyone in the company, we have 43 employees, and each of them are comfortable with, call it the elevator pitch, call it what you'd like, but each has to be comfortable with answering certain questions about Green. The same thing for each of us when we're in the job search mode. We have to be comfortable in answering what are we seeking? Why should someone hire me? What am I good at? Because these questions are going to come to us in a bunch of different ways. Why should I hire you? What are you seeking? What are you good at? And similar questions. In addition, we need to leverage our knowledge. You have spent now so much time researching the industry, researching the companies, the hiring contacts, you should be in a position to make a stronger connection and establish credibility. Through your research, you may have found nonprofits in which the decision maker is active or boards on which they serve. And through your connections, you get someone else involved in that nonprofit or on that board to make an introduction for you. You may have read an article recently in which someone in the company for which you want to work was quoted and impressed you and you sent that article to that person along with their note. You may have utilized the alumni network to find other NCSU graduates working at the company that can serve as a champion for your cause. In fact, this last example, I want to stress this again, the alumni network does an incredible job of putting together programs to connect you to other alumni. Any of these individuals could be your next Kevin Bacon that connects you to that career of choice. University allegiances, they run very deep. In fact, I know a hiring manager here in the Triangle, they'll go nameless, uh, at a company who will not interview a person if he or she has UNC Chapel Hill on his or her resume. Now that may not be an appropriate hiring practice, or maybe it is, but the point is to find a connection that will get you in front of that hiring manager. If I know the person was an athlete of whom is going to interview me, I will highlight my athletic achievements. 
If they have a lot of work accomplishments, I'm going to highlight my career achievements. If they're involved in the nonprofit community, I will highlight the differences I've made in the community. You've got to leverage the knowledge you have gained and the research you have completed on that company and on those hiring contacts. Another approach, and one I use regularly, is to schedule informational interviews instead of job interviews. Once you know the type of work you want to do and have researched the best companies to work for in that field, call the CEO directly. Explain what you have learned about his or her business and that you have an interest in the industry and would like to spend 30 minutes with him or her getting to know their story. If given this opportunity, then always be ready with questions. At the end of the meeting or if the meeting is declined, ask is there somebody else that he or she thinks you should speak with. Regularly, I will have candidates call me and ask to be interviewed for an opening. Now for those, I send them along to the appropriate recruiter. But get this, I will also have someone call directly and say, I'm interested in the recruiting industry, and through my research, I've become very impressed with green resources. I would appreciate 20 minutes of your time, preferably in person, but I'll take it over the phone. I know recruiting is the industry for me, and I would appreciate some advice from what I consider to be one of the best companies in the industry. Now that type of call I personally take and spend time with that person. Informational interviews can go a long way. I want to move now, unless there's questions, to preparing for the interview. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in this area. Oh, Garrett, we don't have a question. But I, just, I wanted to kind of pipe in one more time um, sure. about the previous slide in terms of um, finding connections and utilizing the network. Yes. Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, your mention of LinkedIn earlier. It is an incredible resource um, for people who are looking to make connections. Um, within certain companies and um, industries and with state grads. I think um, people don't utilize it as much as they should. Um, we actually did two whole webinars on it previously. Um, so if, if people need more information, that's a great source. But I've had people have tremendous success thoughtfully reaching out to other alumni on LinkedIn. Um, you know, when they're on that site, they're saying, I'm open to connecting with people. So um, take advantage of that. Thank you for reiterating it. It is extremely important. And if you do not have a LinkedIn account, uh, please do so today so that you can start making those connections. And again, alumni do want to help. And, and don't be afraid to use that connection when making your connections. Let's talk about preparing. Uh, you've landed the interview. Uh, someone has made an introduction for you. You have a chance to sit down, whether it's the informational session or it's an actual interview. How do we prepare for it? First, just as you've done already, you've got to research the company and the organization in depth. Personally, I use LinkedIn, Google, Facebook, the company's website. If they're blogging, tweeting, I look at press releases, executive bios, the company history, any fact sheets that they put out there. I contact people who work there or used to work there or supply goods and services to that company. It's important to find out the decision-making chain, if at all possible. Yes, I'm interviewing this person, but who else is going to be involved in the process? From the uh, job description, can we decipher what is most important in a candidate? And if not, is there someone that we can talk to who can provide such information? I regularly have people who are coming to interview with me who beforehand contact other people in the company to ask them what is the most important to me in a candidate. I think that's wonderful. Even though that person is still coming to tell me they did that, it shows me they're doing their homework and it stands out. Now secondly, you have to identify what you have to sell. We did this earlier. What are our top three skills or experiences that we have to offer this employer that other applicants can't? And spend a lot of time thinking about that and, being, uh, and have that with you when you go to the interview, being ready to talk about it. Go ahead and prepare examples of your work. Anyone can make claims in job interviews. Far fewer people back up those claims with evidence. Consider developing a career portfolio, or what I love, a 90-day plan and using it as a presentation during the interview. What a differentiator it would be 
to say, I spent a lot of time thinking about this position and what it will take to be successful. If you don't mind, I would like to share with you my 90-day plan if I'm given the opportunity to work with you. Then go on to describe what you would do and accomplish in the first 90 days. Your competitors for that position aren't doing it, and you're going to stand out. Now, be very careful with your social sites. It's the way uh, everyone's on them. Uh, it goes back and forth. Technically, a hiring manager should not be using Facebook, but they are. And they're going to be looking at that, and it's going to be viewed by your potential employers. So be very aware of the reviews you give online. If you're someone that likes to right or wrong, complain every time you have poor service online with the world, then the employer is going to see that and make decisions based on how much time you're spending online and doing that. Or uh, depending on where you, the pictures you're taking and the position that puts you in, there are employers that are looking at this before they decide to interview with you or especially after the interview is scheduled and they go out and do their own research. As I mentioned in the previous step, have questions prepared, intelligent questions that also show you have researched the company. For example, instead of what are your growth plans, which I hear a lot from candidates, what are your growth plans, why not ask, here's an example for an international company, I enjoyed reading about your recent acquisition of XYZ Corporation. It appears you benefit greatly in the international market from that acquisition. Any specific goals currently to open offices internationally? that shows that I have taken the time to learn about their company and it's a much more intelligent question versus what are your growth plans? It does not matter how many people you meet, you need to always have questions ready. Even if you ask the same question again, there are too many candidates who miss out on the opportunity because they fail to ask questions. This is a regular occurrence at Green Resources. An applicant will have met three to four people in the company and now they're sitting down with me. I ask them if they have any questions, and they respond, you know what? Your team did a great job answering all my questions. I'm very impressed with the corporation and don't have any other questions at this time. Well, what does that say to me? They have yet to get my opinion on anything and are now giving me the impression they don't even care about my opinion. It's okay to ask questions and you need to be ready with them. It's also okay to interview the hiring authority, so to speak. You don't want to hog the entire time with the 100 questions, but as I mentioned earlier with the informational meetings, meetings, you want to be in a position to ask enough questions and get to know the company. So interview the hiring authority. It's impossible to sell yourself until you know what the hiring authority needs most. And if you're not asking questions to get to know what that is, you will not be effective and proving that you're the right candidate for the position. I would suggest trying to be the first interview or the last interview to be memorable. Now the question is, how do I get to do that? Well, when I'm selling and I know multiple companies are making presentations, I'll ask them what time slots are available and I'll pick the first or last one. If I don't have um, any connections that's going to help me, I'd rather probably be the last one because hopefully through my research people can tell me how the other candidates have done before I go in on the interview. The worst case scenario, you're not able to find out, but it's at least worth trying and getting yourself in a position to become memorable. Always arrive early. I would say 10 to 15 minutes. Beyond 15 minutes is probably too much. Anything less than uh, 10 is, is you're going to be pushing it. Make sure you know how to pronounce the person's name. And when I get to a meeting, I'm always asking the person at the front desk, that director of first impressions, how to pronounce it or call it ahead of time more often than not. It's okay to small talk and learn more from the receptionist. I can tell you that a lot of clients, including us, we're going to go and ask the director of first impressions what the experience was like with that candidate, and that will be part of our decision on whether or not we hire that person. Remember that you're selling yourself first before you can sell your skills. Walk in, off, walk in the office, head up, back straight, face smiling, attitude energetic, animated. Look the person in the eye, shake their hand firmly, make sure your car is clean because sometimes the hiring authority is going to walk with you back to your car. And the only reason is because they want to see how you keep your car. It happens. Be, be ready for these things. When you walk in, always go for the chair. Do not take the couch. 
especially in the lobby. You will not be able to get out of that to be ready to shake the person's hand, and it's just awkward. And on the same lines, I would recommend uh, taking care of your thirst before you go on the interview and not accept the water or coffee. You have your notebook. They need to shake your hand. Now you have water or coffee. And worst case scenario, it ends up all over their office. But it is just awkward, and you want to remain hands-free other than your portfolio and be prepared to greet every person to whom you're introduced. I mentioned being ready with compelling questions. Being ready with those questions, uh, and it's okay to ask. Answer the. Um, if you could hire, for example, here's a question. If you could hire, what position? All, what position would be first and why? So you have a lot of uh, positions open. Which of these positions would you like to take care of first? Or if you wouldn't mind taking a minute describing to me, this is one that's asked to me a lot. I think it's a great question. Describe to me the perfect candidate. It's going to put you in a better position to respond to that need. Also take copious notes. People say it doesn't look good to take notes. At a restaurant, I do not like it when someone memorizes my order. I'd rather see them write it down. Same is true in the hiring process. People want to see that you're writing down what they say and that it's important. When the job is described, pay close attention, giving nonverbal feedback. Be aware of yours and their nonverbal feedback. Are you sitting upright, leaning forward slightly, nodding your head, giving eye contact? When you're talking, are they giving the signal that you're talking too much or that they're bored? You've got to pay attention to those things. Be, wary, be very careful of talking too much. Answer the question being asked, and be careful not to ramble. Always have multiple copies of your resume, and make sure the resume is written to that specific job. If you have an objective, make sure it describes wanting that job being discussed. Seven times out of ten, when there's an objective written, the objective has nothing to do with the job that candidate is interviewing for. Make sure it's written to that specific job. Rearrange your resume to match the job posting. With any company you're interviewing, put yourself in a position to be able to talk as well about their company as you are your own resume. Be ready for surprises. Most of the time they do these things on purpose. They're going to send someone else in the room. They're going to tell you you can't meet with someone, that someone else is going to have to interview. It's going to be at a different location. A lot of times it's on purpose to see how you react to those situations. Now, sometimes it, it's just it just happens, but you need to be ready for those surprises. Get plenty of rest the night before. Plan your attire ahead of time. You're going to make a mistake. We all do. Be at peace with that. Your interview is not going to go perfectly, so don't let the rest of your interview get sidetracked because of one mistake earlier on. And you need to develop your clothes. Successful salespeople know how to effectively close meetings. You need to do the same as a candidate. Once the interview is over and you're walking down the hall, that's not the time to close. You've done it in the room. You're heading out. And be careful not to continue the interview as you walk out the door. And one other thing I want to add here, this could be another whole talk, but when you're interviewing over a meal, there's a reason for that. And you want to be careful. You, uh, if you know the restaurant ahead of time, call that restaurant. Take a look at their menu online. Know what you're going to order ahead of time. Nothing, order very light. Nothing that's going to splatter. Stick to your teeth. The interview over a meal is all about being able to hold a conversation. It is critical that you have researched the company, industry, market, and you have intelligent conversations over that meal. It is not your traditional interview. You need to be ready to converse. The last thing I want to share in this is what I call my unlucky seven. And those are this, not being prepared, no resume, or not having enough, not having questions, not knowing the resume that you have. Too many times people don't even know the resume they've handed out. Having an objective that's different than the position. Having a poor presentation. Poor grooming, poor appearance. Resume folded or stuffed in a purse or typos on the resume. Poor communication, not being able to project your views clearly. Lack of self-confidence and enthusiasm. Ask for the job. Thank them for the interview. Not asking questions. They should be insightful, engaging. Never I think you covered it. It doesn't matter how many people you see. Make sure you ask questions. Don't over-criticize your former employers. And make sure you're able to fill in your gaps on your resume or any job transition. 
some of the basic questions you're going to want to be prepared for or what are your career goals? Why did you leave your last job? Why does this job interest you? And what do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? Gary. Yes. We have a question from Frank. Um, he's wondering what you recommend carrying the resume in for an interview. I would say a portfolio. So typically the, you're going to have a portfolio with a pad that you can take notes on and the resume should be in that so that you can pull it out easily and hand it to them. I was just at Kinko's the other day and uh, found a very nice uh, leather that was maybe four dollars, but um, that if you were really just carrying in your resume that nicely goes into that sleeve and you're able to pull it out. But you need to go in with something to take notes and so typically I would recommend putting it in that portfolio with the um, notepad. I would agree. I mean, you want to come across professional, and so you, you want to make that investment to carry something that looks professional and makes you look prepared. Yeah, the last thing you want is to be pulling it out of your uh, pocket of your coat that's folded or out of the purse, which I see way too many times. It is, you're, you're caring for that uh, resume as you would a business card or whatnot, and it's, it's, it's you. It's who you are, and uh, make sure that it's uh, very crisp and clean. Other questions? Not at the moment, but I'm hoping it looks like we are going to have some time at the end. So if people do have questions, please um, keep typing them in. I do want to cover one more thing before we end, and that is the follow-up. Always send a handwritten thank you note. And this is something that people will discuss with me ongoing. Why not an email? Do an email. An email is great. It, and yes, it's quicker. Still follow up with a handwritten note. Cecilia Grimes, Grimes someone that, that lives just outside the Triangle, has a company called Etiquette Matters. And she wrote a wonderful article on the art of writing a thank you note. It has made a tremendous difference in the way I send out notes. And it, she explains to first tilt the note toward the recipient. Typically we write, I want to thank you. Well, it should start with you or your. Then include details, illustrations, examples, address the card with the Mr. or Miss or Doctor, whatever is appropriate. Use interesting professional stamps on the envelope. Maintain crisp margins. Uh, pull out the thesaurus. Replace thanks with words like appreciate and grateful. Replace nice, good, great, wonderful with words like delightful, stimulating, captivating, inspired. Use memorable words. If you're following up with the proposal, or plan, make sure it is laser focused to the specific opportunity at hand. As I mentioned, the 90 day plan, it needs to be laser focused to that specific position. I'm going to go to the next slide here. And Gary, we, we yes. have a, I want to say one quick thing, and then we have a question from Bryant. Uh, and I know that was specifically about handwritten thank you notes, but one thing that I see a lot of is people sending a um, mass thank you that so they interviewed with four people sending a generic thank you to four no. people. Right. Yeah, I would I would say and I, and I like what you said about being specific. So send each person a very specific thank you note that addresses, you know, a topic that you discussed with that person or something that resonated with you. Um, Bryant has a question, how many strengths and weaknesses would you recommend somebody have um, but it, you know, in terms of being ready to talk about? At least three of each. Okay, great. And Larry... Uh, the weaknesses though, you're going to want to be stronger on your strengths than the weaknesses. Everyone wants to know that you have a weakness. I would not have more weaknesses than <laughs> your strengths. And you just want to be prepared in case they push. But even when I'm selling, I'm going to, um, it's never more than one weakness that I'm going to talk about unless they ask for it. So I'll be prepared with it, but I'm going to uh, talk more about the strengths than I am the weaknesses. Be prepared to talk with one that's relevant for the position that doesn't keep me out of the position and actually then turn that weakness into a strength based on, uh, like let's say the position is a very detail-oriented position and one of your weaknesses is being too detail-oriented. Well, it could be a weakness, but for that position, specific position, it may end up being a stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a key point. I think the key point is, one, they want to make sure you're self-aware enough to know that you do have your shortcomings, right? That's right. And, and two, you know, making sure that you are clear about how you're addressing that weakness, right? So how do right. you make that a positive? Right. Um, We've got another question from, from Larry who uh, is wondering, he's seen several sites that recommend the objective be eliminated from the resume. 
um, you include it so that you can target the specific the position specifically. Um, oh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I see more people getting in trouble with the objective, and so I I'd agree with those articles. You do not need to have an objective on your resume. If you have one, though, make it specific to that position. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it effective. But it is okay not to have an objective. Yeah. At this point, the summary statement is probably more important than that an objective. Correct. Yep. Correct. Um, and Elliot is wondering. Um, he said, uh, and I'm sorry, Elliot. I'm, uh, I said he. I'm assuming. Um, I submit a lot of, of um, line resumes online, but find it difficult to follow up with a real person. Right. Any recommendations there? Definitely. The um, and most companies, as I said earlier, are, are, are requiring that you do that. This is where LinkedIn is going to be uh, extremely helpful. You need to find someone who knows someone that maybe even knows someone that works at that company that can help uh, at least get your resume noticed or give you feedback about that position. And it takes work in your network. It is, a, as I said at the beginning, a full-time job in the search. And I will spend a lot of time finding several resources within that company or, or a vendor to that company that can help make sure my resume gets seen. So even if I'm presenting proposals to a company, I want someone else in that company to go to that decision maker and say, listen, uh, you need to see this person. Regularly, we have candidates that know we work with a certain company, let's say Fast Institute, for example. And because of us working there and they see a full-time job, they'll call and say, can you at least introduce me? I'll apply for the position. We have a vested interest in helping everyone, so we will go. We're not trying to make a placement. We're just going to the hiring authorities to say, Here's a resume that you should at least take a look at. Because if you don't, no matter how good the resume is, there's 300 other resumes sitting there. So you have to work your network to find someone that can help make that introduction and at least give you feedback as to other things you should do to get the position. Yeah, and I think that speaks to kind of what we've been talking about this whole time in terms of being proactive, being specific, knowing yes. who you want to reach out to, what companies you're targeting. Because it, you know, just applying online and then putting all this time into find people if you're not really sure why the position or why the company you know, isn't going to do you any good. So it really is about taking the time on the front end to decide what you want to do, why, and then and then start to look for contacts proactively. That's correct. Uh, and one more up oh, there coming in, Gary. Uh, Bob has a question. Could you elaborate and give an example of a good weakness? How would you answer that question? And again, I think the key uh, point uh, is go ahead. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. It's going to depend on the person and what the weakness may be. So. This happened, I can tell you a negative one, that uh, we were hiring for a position that required detail orientation. The person said their weakness was they're not detail oriented. That simply was a person that did not look at the job description. So whatever your weaknesses are, the last thing you want to do is list a weakness that you can tell in the job description is a critical part of that position. And so I would, it, it's difficult without looking at a job description. But I would use the job description to be able to come up with a weakness that actually can be viewed also as a string. Like the example I gave um, earlier of maybe being too detail oriented or I get very focused on a project. Um, that can be a great weakness when it is very project specific in the work. But if you have to juggle a lot of tasks, the last thing you want to do is say that you don't know how to juggle a lot of tasks by saying you get very focused at one project at a time. So it's going to depend on the, on the positions. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can use very focused on one project. Uh, the one that I use, um, if I don't have one that I would rather talk about, is um, if you're asking my weakness compared to other candidates, I understand you're also looking at internal candidates for this position as well. And I haven't worked at your company. I haven't been here. But let me tell you how I've overcome that weakness. Here's my 90-day plan. And I know that I can come here and be successful. But really, the weakness I think I have in a, as a perception is not being here already. Uh, but that's why I spend this amount of time getting to know your industry and your business. That would be the one I would, I would use to give a specific example.
That's great. That was a great example. Um, Frank has a question about, um, he says, with the increased diversity of the workplace, we have many names that are not as gender specific as Frank, Larry, and Sarah. Uh, is it worth a phone call ahead of time to find out if a named hiring official is male or female so that you can specifically address them as Mr. or Mrs.? Absolutely. Please do that. It is, it is so embarrassing to have sent these letters and to get there and find out that she was a he or that he was a she. And you can just call and even the security person at the front desk when you have the name can tell you whether that person's a he or a she. Great. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of the hour. I just want to show one more thing and uh, if there's a few extra minutes uh, for questions. But anything that you're doing, Ken Blanchard put this in one of his books called Gung Ho. He called it something else. I call it the follow-up continuum. But try to take anything that you do and get less program, more spontaneous. Less blanketed, more individual. Less general, more specific. And less traditional and more unique. The better you are at doing this, the greater your success. Now speaking of non-traditional, I want to share with you uh, this uh, follow-up after receiving a rejection letter. Uh, just, dear Mr. Connors, thank you for your letter of February 17th. After careful consideration, I regret to inform you that I am unable to accept your refusal to offer me employment with your bank. This year I have been particularly fortunate in receiving an unusually large number of rejection letters. With such a varied and promising field of candidates, it is impossible for me to accept all refusals. Despite your company's outstanding qualifications and previous experience in rejecting applicants, I find that your rejection does not meet my needs at this time. Therefore, I will initiate employment with your firm immediately following graduation. I look forward to seeing you then. Now, did this letter earn this person a job? <laughs> Likely not, but it is spontaneous, it's individual, it's specific and unique. And maybe, just maybe, it opened the door to another conversation. So in conclusion, I want to remind everyone on the call, we want to identify our gifts, develop a target list of companies that can use those gifts, research those companies and industries, use our network to get introduced and land the interview, be properly prepared for that interview, and follow up in a way that makes us memorable. And in the end, create the standout experience. As I said in the beginning, there are simple, these are simple steps, but oh so very hard to do. Doing them are going to increase your chances to land quickly in that career choice. Any other questions? Gary, thank you so much for, for coming in and doing this presentation for our alumni. I know everybody here live with us appreciates it, and everyone who will view it afterwards um, will appreciate it. Um, we are going to email everyone who registered um, and everyone who's on the session now uh, a link to the recording as well as the slides that they get a question about that, whether we would share the PowerPoint. So we're happy to do that. Um, Gary, we do have a question, and please, you know, it is 1 o'clock, we know people have to sign off, but if you do um, have questions, we do have a little bit of uh, time to take those. Um, Gary, specific tips for phone interviews. Yes. Uh, in fact, we do this also, and I mean, all of this is relevant to how we sell every day. Uh, when you schedule the phone interview, you're going to have to find a place wherever that is. So even when we have important uh, calls in our office, that person has to go into an office, close the door, put a note on the door, whatever the case may be. But find a place so that you, it's going to be, there are, there are no distractions. There's not even a chance if you're at home that they can hear the children outside the door, or the dog barking. Find a way to, um, so that you can have complete focus on that uh, interview. It's going to be even more important that you do the research to know the people that are on the call because you're not going to be able to see them and it's very difficult to judge uh, how they're responding to how you answer questions. So when it's a phone interview, I would even stress further when they answer your question, be specific in responding to that question and be very careful about rambling because you can't get the nonverbal cues that you're speaking too much. So be focused on their answers and being ready with quality questions to engage in the conversation once given the opportunity 
for that. But most importantly is finding the area to be focused, researching ahead of time to know who's on the call. Uh, usually with a phone interview, I'm not able to see something around the office to connect to. So to break the ice in the beginning, usually there's a chance to uh, in introductions, and you can use what you've learned about their company recently to do that. You know, I enjoyed reading your blog recently on XYZ, whatever it may be, to break the ice at the beginning of that interview to warm it up a little bit because phone interviews are the most cold <laughs> of getting through and you've got to find a way to break the ice in the beginning. That would be some of my recommendations. Yeah, and if you can, um, uh, you know, I know everybody has a cell phone these days and few, few people have landlines, but if you can find a landline to use, if you have a friend who may have an extra office that you could, you know, borrow for an hour or, um, you know, if you're a recent grad, the Career Center may have a space for you to go back and use, um, you know, those types of things so you know it's a solid connection and your phone's not going to cut out in the middle of the conversation. Um, also, standing up for whatever reason actually affects um, the tone of your voice. Um, and so standing sometimes, and it also helps with nerves for some people um, to stand up. And, and one more piece on my end would be not to script um, script out answers for yourself to try to um, anticipate what they're going to ask and then come across stiff. I mean, have some bullet points in front of you and some key points that you want to remember, but don't try to read anything verbatim. Those are all great points. And whatever time frame they give to the interview, uh, recognize that. So if I'm in a meeting, like we, we went over and it was recognized we were going over the time. If I'm in a meeting and it was 15 minutes, at the end of 15 minutes, I'll say, we're at the end of 15 minutes and I know we only have that amount of time. Same thing with the call. I don't want to keep talking when I know we're out of time. I want to get permission to continue that discussion if we're at the end of that uh, point in time. Great. Well, Gary, thank you so much again. You're um, welcome. Uh, and again, we'll email this out to everyone. Um, we appreciate everyone that joined us live. And um, please join us in May for Gary's next webinar um, on the topic of becoming unforgettable. All right, go pack. <laughs>